Well, welcome church to our first video in our act series. In this week we'll be covering chapters 1 through 3. Now in case you've missed the introductions at church, we are going to be spending as part of our TBT or our family, our church family devotion, we'll be spending the next 12 weeks moving through this fantastic book of Acts. It's all about sea journeys, shipwrecks, frontline missions, big cities, mob riots, everything is in there. But it's actually, well, it's really though about two things. It's about Jesus carrying on his work of salvation. Luke, as he writes his two volumes, the Gospel of Luke and Acts, is very clear that when Jesus came, and he records the events of how Jesus dies and bears man's sin before God pays for it, finishes the work of salvation, and, and, and resurrects from the dead. Luke is then clear when he, when he begins his second volume now in Acts. He says this was all about what that was all what Jesus began to do and teach. Jesus ascends, but he doesn't stop being active and involved in the building of his church. Just as he promises, I will build my church. And so this, you will see throughout this book, Jesus very intentionally, very much involved, building his church as we move through these chapters. And the second thing this book's about is the church itself. We get a frontline seat. As I said, this, this week we will be moving through chapters 1, 2 and 3. And I encourage you to read these throughout the weeks, however you break up your day or your, your, your studies. Read through these chapters, noting down everything, drawing out from the text everything that te it teaches you about Jesus and his carrying on this work. But also look specifically for what it tells you about being the church and the power that the church has. That's, the, that's not going to be our point for this week, uh, specifically on this point too. The power, its source, and its use. All right. As I say, this is my first video. My intention with these videos is not to replace your study or to do it all for you. That will be clear, I think. I simply want to introduce the text each week and give you a little bit of an idea of the overview, uh, a little bit of an overview, a little bit of a structure. I find this helpful when I come to study something, if I already know a little bit about the passage, how it's broken down. And I may even be able to provide some uh, visual visual aids along the way. All right, that being said, let me give you that very brief overview of the first three chapters. And um, my aim is now here to do this each week, to move down through on this side, all the events of the chapters, and then to show over here, just to give that overview of that work that Jesus is carrying on. As you read, the, the ch first chapter is very much how would you say very foundational? Before things really get going, it's about getting ready, getting the disciples uh, trained up, that they know that Jesus, re they really have witnessed Jesus alive, and that he has trained them about the kingdom and the right timings of things. Uh, and having had them trained, he then sends them out, tells them that they'll be going out and bearing witness about him, and then he leaves them in the ascension, leaves them to the work. And the first chapter really just rounds off with that 12th disciple, Judas is gone, Matthias is now brought in, the 12, that core team, is now complete, and they're ready to go. And from there, it moves into two chapters which are really showing examples of, of ministry, of, of, of um, how would you say, sermons. They've been given the option to do these sermons because there's been a miraculous event. So it's miracles and messages I've called that, these two chapters, and you'll see there's a new community is formed. And these are the beginnings, chapter two, I think it, it's it's the very first time that the Spirit comes, but there's such general terms here. I think Luke is giving us a taste of more or less what happens generally. And in, in chapter 3, which is our focus passage, there is um, an event which focuses around the temple and will lead into next week, which is a lot about persecution. These three chapters, get ready, go, is how I said it. And you can see Jesus is beginning to to, to get things going, so the pattern is not yet evident. But he starts with the disciples and he's moving out into that immediate area of Jerusalem and the Jews that are there. After the first sermon, there's 3,000 brought in. After that, there's another 5,000. And um, the numbers become, I think, too big to count beyond that. So certainly this is, this is an explosive start and has to be deity behind it. There's the overview of the three chapters. Jesus does mention up in chapter 1, three kind of boundaries, three geographical boundaries. He says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and then in the end of the world. And I think this sets a kind of a geographical tone to the book. 
and we'll be able to see as we move through him breaking through those boundaries. And I thought that therefore it might be good to show some maps along the way. My first map then is just a little one about the Jerusalem itself. Because it's here where the events this week take place. Here is Jerusalem, the city, the city walls, and you'll see here is, the, is that central part of the temple. The, uh, the court of the Gentiles, the big one, and the inner, the inner courts uh, and the temple itself. I've noted also possible location of Golgotha where, the, where Jesus was crucified and possibly where he was laid in the tomb. These should just, I think, always be in mind as we go through this book. Here's the Brukidron. Here are the, the, are the Mount of Olives and Bethany's over here. And it's here in the Mount of Olives where Jesus gives that last appearance to his disciples and he ascends, leaving them speechless looking up. And they move into the city then and they're in a house, we don't know exactly where, I'm guessing it's somewhere down here in the lower city. They're in a house when the Holy Spirit comes and this is the scenes of chapter 2 are down here where the crowd are witness to. Chapter 3 is happening up here in this, in this area of the temple. Peter and John are going through the Gate Beautiful on their way to prayer. This is the Gate Beautiful. It's moving from the Gentile court into the, the court of the women. And then further that would be on further into the court of the Israelites and the temple itself. And it's this, it's this gate here, which is the gate beautiful. And this is where the beggar is lying. And this is Solomon's, um, Solomon's porch, where that, um, that sermon, those events in chapter 3 take place. Speaking of chapter 3, let me say these three chapters may be a lot for you to, to, to lead your children through if you've got small children or even if you're a life group wanting to sit and study one text. And so we've suggested that you look at one text in particular. We've given you like a focus passage and there'll be a focus passage for each section. Now the focus passage is chapter 3 more or less verses 1 to 21. It is broken down. Chapter 3 is broken down so... It has got, uh, at the beginning, a narrative and then a, or a, an account of a healing of a lame man, as we said. And then there is a massive crowd drawn to this event because this guy was possibly lying there for 40 years. He is definitely a, a VIP and that gives Peter the opportunity to deliver another sermon. Now, if you're leading your kids through this, this will be the easy bit, I think. Sometimes the sermon is a little bit more difficult, but when it comes to the sermon, I, I suggest just look for the look for the point that Peter's trying to make. What is the argument he's presenting? And I believe it's in the form of a timeline. You can study this for yourself. He takes them through the fact that this event is connected with Jesus, Jesus who they crucified. He then says that God raised Jesus from the dead and glorified him, and it's this Jesus that has healed this man. This same Jesus that will return, that is planning to return, to restore all things. Peter takes this moment, this, this miracle, to point to the fact that, hey, you guys are in this timeline, you're in this series of events. This is Jesus working, and that means you guys are guilty, because you, you killed this Jesus. And it's, it's God that has raised him from the dead. And so you find yourselves guilty of crimes against God, of, of God's, against God's Holy One. And so Peter's saying this power that's displayed in this event is an indication of your guilt. But it's, it's also an indication of the fact that there is a salvation on offer for you. Because this Jesus, as we said, the last event in this, on the timeline, is aiming to come back and restore guilty man. And so this is the true power this is like a little window into the big plan of God. This is a little foretaste or a, um, an insight. But this is this idea of God coming and restoring guilty man and fallen creation is, is the big news that, the, that Peter wants to tell people. And so there you go. Take a look. You've got children. Maybe you just simply get the point across that Jesus is alive and he is active. This, he is in the power that he is manifesting through his church. It shows the fact that he is he is alive. I hope and I'll be praying for us all as we move through these books, uh, these chapters. Sorry, take a note simply as we said what Jesus is carrying on his work and what it means to be the church.